Well, good morning, everyone. Okay, now I'm on. I'll say that again. Good morning, everyone. We, uh, we have a much nicer morning than we had on our last outdoor service. A uh, bit drier, uh, although a bit sunnier. And we are very, very thankful for that. Welcome to Oaklawn Bible Church. It's good to have all of you here. At this time, let's go to our Lord in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this time to come together as a church family and worship you. We thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us. What a blessing to come together to sing your praises, to lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, I would pray that during the course of this service, you would speak to our hearts as we focus on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We would ask God that your Holy Spirit would take the word of God and make it plain and clear and true to us as we investigate it together. And I would pray that as we sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs, that we would do so under the guidance and leadership of your Holy Spirit. Use this morning, Lord, to transform us more into the image of Christ. And we would ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. But well, we have a special guest with us. Um, we, we had to call him this week and say, surprise, we're meeting outside. But Phil Hawes is with us this morning. He is with the Gideon's ministry. And we have just so appreciated the work and the ministry of the Gideons, uh, the way that they are getting the word of God out, which always goes forth in the power of God and never returns void. We're grateful for that. So, Phil, would you come and share with us? Hey, thank you, thank Pastor you. Rob. It's good to be with you this morning at Oak Long Bible Church. And look at all the people out here. And we can worship together outside in God's creation and beauty. I got a blue one in the car. <clears throat> COVID came to us in 2020, and it stopped the Gideon ministry yeah. and probably your church from getting together. But it didn't stop us from praying for the lost. Today, we are together again and have monthly meetings and we have church services again. I'm going to talk to you this morning for a minute about Fernand. And he lived with his mother and one-year-old brother and his mother's boyfriend in a hostile situation in Mexico. Uh, the house was broken into and this brother's belongings were taken and sold. Yet Ferdinand did not lose hope. Some men from a church nearby came to the house, their house and shared the gospel with them. At the same time, his mom went to work in a garbage dump, collecting everything she could to provide for the family. And a neighbor even made a uh, temporary house built with palm leaves and tree poles. That was their new home. One day his mom found some testaments from the Gideons in the trash. Soon they learned about the Lord and dependence on him. For Ferdinand, he understood the plan of salvation and gave his life to Jesus Christ. From that testament, he learned the biblical text, beginning with the help in time of need section, and his heart was comforted. And he found guidance with difficult life issues, including how to deal with, deal with anxiety. The scriptures changed Fernand and his family's life. Fernand even used what he learned from the Testament to help him with evangelism. His mother became a Christian later on, and God provided a stable job for her in, hotel, in a hotel where she later became a cook and the family was able to purchase a home. Fernand is eternally grateful for God's word and the Gideons. And the testament from the Gideons came into his hands, changed his life and destiny. The word, the Gideons was most precious to him. If I gave you a copy of God's word and challenged you to go to someone, maybe after church today, uh, a neighbor, a worker, 
relative, relative and show them God's word, how they can be saved and accept Jesus in their hearts, could you do it? We as Gideons distribute God's word and talk to them about the love of Christ with helps in the front and the plan of salvation in the back so they can receive Christ in their hearts. And then encourage them to seek out a church such as Oak Lawn Bible Church to grow in their newborn faith. And you as believers can help and encourage them. One thing I like to do is talk and pray with pastors. If it wasn't for their pastors and their support, we would not have a Gideon ministry. Are you praying for Pastor Rob? Encourage him, praying for his wife and family? Your pastor needs it all the time. Your pastor encourages and challenges you every Sunday by preaching the word. He has prepared his message all through the week, backed by prayer and praying for you. Last March, we had a state convention. And the Friday night of the convention, we had a pastor's appreciation banquet, inviting the local pastors in that area and their wives to dinner and thanked them for their ministry and prayed for them. They need our encouragement also. We pray for your ministry here at Oak Long Bible, that souls will be saved through preaching of God's word. Attendance will increase and spiritual growth will occur. Also, I'm sure in your prayers, you're praying for the country of Ukraine. There are 1,534 Gideons active in Ukraine with their families. And last report we got, they're all safe and sound. Um, we, the International is sending over 500,000 scriptures for them to distribute to f people in Ukraine, Poland, and outlying countries. Um, display safe table is set up there for you to look at the brochures and take a brochure reminding you to pray for our ministry. And we also encourage you to use the Gideon cards that were placed in your church and uh, support and send a card out to someone in the family. Maybe they're grieving or just thinking about them or thanking even a card for the pastor, thanking him for his sermons. Also, there's an offering plate basket there for you to contribute to our ministry. But 100% of that money only goes to purchasing God's word and distributing around the world. But first, we always say contribute to your church first. And then whatever you might be able to distribute to the Gideons. And 100% goes to the work of the Gideons. Thank you, Pastor Rob. Thank you, congregation, for letting us come and tell you a little bit about the Gideons. God bless. Psalm 100, it says this. It's a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's sing this morning. Come thou fount of every blessing. If you didn't get a song sheet, they are on the table over there if you need the words, but let's sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Upon it, name of thy. 
by seeing God undefeatable.
scripture readings this morning, um, one from Corinthians and one from Ephesians. The first one is 2 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession. To the, to the praise of his glory. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, thank you, Leo. Please leave your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians 1.21. That's going to be our starting point. Have you ever had a product and you look at it and you think, this is great. And it even comes with a guarantee. And then you find out that the product is garbage and the guarantee is worthless. As a matter of fact, I've often found that the more a company stresses its guarantee, probably the more worthless the product is. I remember one time I ordered a watch from the newspaper. And it was a really cool watch. It was digital and analog. And I looked at that and said, man, five bucks will get me a digital and analog watch. That's awesome. And... 
It came with a satisfaction guarantee. So I wait in the mail for the four weeks. Finally, it comes. And it was digital, but the analog was only right twice a day because it was a picture printed on the face. I'd been had. Nobody wanted to hear from me on the guarantee. It was a joke. There are a lot of things in life that we can become disappointed by. That guarantee that we thought was ironclad turns out to have a lot of small print that we didn't anticipate. And we find ourselves disappointed. That will never be the case with God. When God makes a pledge or a promise, it's for keeps. There's no small print, no sleight of hand. It's absolutely true. And we can count on that. And to me, the most important area where the promise of God has such great significance is the area of our salvation. Our eternity is at stake. So when God makes a promise about our salvation, boy, I hope it's true. What do I base that hope on? I base it on the very Word of God and passages like the one we're looking into this morning. That's what our hope is based on. This morning we're going to talk about the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to see as we look at the revelation from Scripture of this sealing ministry, I only picked two passages. There are others that talk about the Holy Spirit sealing us. Now, what does it mean that the Holy Spirit seals us? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand this. We are granted the Spirit as a down payment of what is to come. Now, let that sink in for just a minute. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are given eternal life. It is solely on the basis of your faith. It is not by your works. It is freely given by God. Nothing you do will make you any more saved than you are at the moment that you receive Christ as your Savior. It's ironclad. It is the promise of eternal life. It lasts forever. And it's all on the basis of God's grace and your faith. When we think about grace, we have to understand what grace means. Grace is unmerited favor. It is God giving us something that we have not earned. And often what we think of in terms of God's grace is purely salvation. But there are so many other aspects to what God gives us so freely by his grace. And one of the things that God gives us is the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Look carefully at that 2 Corinthians passage. And notice what Paul writes in that 21st verse. He says, it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. Now here the Apostle Paul was talking to the church at Corinth that was kind of a cantankerous church. They had a lot of fighting and arguing and disagreement. And what Paul wanted to do was talk to them about their commonality in the faith. The fact that because they are all believers in Christ, they are established together in their faith, established in their relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, that's so important for us to remember. We're going to have differences and disagreements with other believers, but when a person truly places their faith in Jesus Christ, we are established together. We are established with one another, but more importantly, we are established with God. It's settled. It's final. I have a relationship with God. That has been established. But notice he also says in that 21st verse, Now it is God who establishes us with you in Christ, and has anointed us. What does it mean that God has anointed us? The fact that God has anointed us very simply means that we are set apart as his. When things were anointed in the Old Testament, 
It was a testimony that this belongs to God. So when we are said to be anointed, we are identified as the people of God, possessions of God. But it means even more than that. Anointing was a blessing. It was a statement of one's special reception of blessing from God. The priests were anointed as they began their priestly duties. Leaders were anointed because they were set apart as God to be leaders. So when the text says here that he has anointed us, he's speaking to all believers. We have all been designated by God as his servants belonging to him and especially empowered by him. You see, in the Old Testament, when the priests or the kings would discharge their duty, it was by the power of God and his anointing that they did so. This has something special to say to us. I live the Christian life not because of my own power, not because of my own abilities, but because of the anointing of God. The anointing of God does so much in our lives John writes of this anointing the following. He says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, The anointing you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what the anointing of the Holy Spirit does for us. It guides us in truth. This anointing teaches us what is of God and what is not. But then we come to the 22nd verse. And after this introduction to the fact that we've been established in Christ, we've been anointed by the Holy Spirit, it goes on to give us this encouragement. And has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now I want you to think about what's being communicated in this very short verse because it's profound. When the word of God shares with us that God has put his seal on us, it's hard for people in our culture to understand this. But in the time in which Paul wrote, a seal was something significant. You see, when an emperor or a leader, a governor, a general would write a document that was a decree or a command or a contract, they would roll it up, place a wax seal across the seam, and then they would take their ring and they would press it on the seal. Now, the wax seal itself didn't have that much power. Anybody can break wax. What had the power was the sign of the ring. It was a statement that all of the power, authority, and everything that is wrapped up in being that dignitary is there on that seal. You break it at your peril. For Roman emperor, all of the power of Rome was behind that seal. So when an order was given, it was not to be broken. When the Word of God tells us, right here in this passage, that God has put his seal on us and given us his spirit, what's it communicating to us? It means that when I have trusted Jesus Christ, I am sealed by the very power of God. He holds me. It is not my faithfulness, my performance, that brings me into right standing with God or keeps me in right standing with God. It is his seal that holds me. This is so important for us to grasp. One commentator put it this way. God stamps his own invisible mark on every believer, the Holy Spirit, and guarantees his or her preservation as God's child and servant. Thus, the seal of God, in addition to the promise of God, guarantees the believer's eternal security. 
What keeps me a Christian? Is it my personal performance? Man, I hope not. You see, if it's based on personal performance, when do I know whether or not I've hit that mark that makes me no longer God's? If it's doubting, is it the fleeting doubt? Is it a prolonged doubt? Is it the kind of doubt? There are so many subjective errors that I could commit if I can somehow lose what God has pledged to me. What we need to remember is this. My salvation rests in God, never in me. And if it rested in me, I'd find a way to mess up. I guarantee it. But because it rests in God, I can take solace in that. I can take comfort in that truth. Now look at the last part of that 22nd verse. And he has given us his spirit in our hearts. Now the ESV says, as a guarantee. Other translations render this as a pledge, as a deposit. One even translated it as earnest money. Here's what the idea is. When you give a pledge or earnest money, what are you doing? You're putting something forward, demonstrating that you intend to fulfill the contract. You buy a house. You put earnest money down that you intend to get financing and then fulfill the contracts of the price that you've agreed upon. What happens if you totally wipe out following through on the contract to the earnest money? You forfeit it. It goes away. Do you know what God is saying in this text? As far as my salvation, God has given the Holy Spirit as his earnest money that he will fulfill the pledge that he's given us of eternal life. So if God were to forfeit the completion of my salvation, then God would forfeit the Holy Spirit. Now those are powerful words. And it's written powerfully to give us confidence, hope, trust, faith in God, not in us. Now, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Another aspect of the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit is found in Ephesians 1 verse 13. Now, I'm going to be reading from the NIV rather than your ESV Bible, so Bear with me, it, it's going to read a little bit differently, but frankly, I think they did a little bit better job in translating these two particular verses than the ESV. So let's look at it. Ephesians 1.13, and you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, look carefully at what brings us into being included in Christ. In other words, being right with God. It's laid out for us right here in this text. First of all, it says, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Do you know what brings me to a personal relationship with God? Hearing the gospel. It's not something that I come to on my own. It isn't me arriving at a thought that I think, well, this should get me in right standing with God and coming up with it all on my own. That's not the way I come into a relationship with God. I come into a relationship with God through the way that God has said I do. He is the one who sets the terms. And the gospel are God's terms. Now, what are the terms of the gospel? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. My 
entrance into a relationship with God comes from me hearing the gospel and then look carefully at that 13th verse, having believed, in other words, me responding to the gospel by simple faith, taking God at his word, and then the moment that I place my faith in Jesus Christ, what does the scripture say? That we are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, once again, we see this sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. None of us were sealed by the Holy Spirit apart from grace. God's grace and grace alone brings me into right standing. It wasn't my personal performance before I come into a relationship with God or what I will eventually do after I come into that relationship with God. It was solely based on God offering forgiveness, right standing with him through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit tells me the truth in his word that it's not on the basis of works that I am saved, but on the basis of faith. Scripture is so clear in this. In the book of Ephesians, a little bit later in the second chapter, we find Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. I would submit to you that apart from humbling ourselves and recognizing that my works do not bring me into a right relationship with God, until I come to that place of humility, I cannot receive grace. If grace by its definition means God gives me something that I have not earned, how can I approach God and say, God, I earned this, so therefore you owe me. That's not grace. Grace is looking at ourselves and saying, I am a helpless, hopeless sinner in need of your forgiveness. And I come to you bringing nothing. I just take you at your word and trust that Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient for my salvation. That's the grace that brings us into right standing with God. Now, what is unfortunate is there are many who will agree with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that my salvation is on the basis of grace and faith is simply that arm that reaches out and receives the grace of God. But then they get confused after salvation. They think that they begin their salvation by faith, but then they keep their salvation by works. This was a confusing thought that had crept into the church of the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul writes to the Galatians the following, Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it is in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Do you hear Paul's point? You begin your salvation by faith and you continue your salvation by faith. It is God's work of grace that changes us. One of the most beautiful passages in Scripture is John chapter 10, verse 28. In it he says this, and this is Jesus speaking, I Give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Do you catch that? The sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are God's and that my salvation is based on on the person of God and the power of God and the promise of God, never on the basis of my personal performance. Something else. Look again at Ephesians chapter 1. We have been marked in him with a seal. Now we saw what that meant in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We have received that sealing of the Holy Spirit 
by faith. And then look at verse 14. Once again, we see this concept of a guarantee expressed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 14 says this, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now I want us to break down this verse because it's very significant. We need to understand that first of all, we have the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The same concept as earnest money is repeated again in this passage. We are given the Holy Spirit as a down payment of what is to come. That's what's being communicated right here in this text. So we have the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. What is our inheritance? Our inheritance is all that is contained in eternal life, all that is blessed and given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our inheritance is. And when will this be completed? Our inheritance will not be completed until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Now, redemption of those who are God's possession. We were redeemed when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. Redeemed very simply means bought out of sin, delivered into a relationship with the Father. Everyone who has believed on Christ has been redeemed. But when it talks about the redemption of those who are God's possession, it carries with it the idea of this. As far as my position, I'm redeemed as far as God is concerned. But as far as my experience, I don't always live like a person who's been redeemed. I sin. I fail. I mess up. Does that mean that God looks at me and says... Well, you're not behaving like a redeemed person, so therefore, bye-bye? No. I want you to look at this verse. The Holy Spirit is our deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until when? Until I mess up? No. Until I have a season of doubt? Not mentioned. He is my deposit guaranteeing inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. In other words until the completion of my salvation. When we trust Christ, we are redeemed. And what that means is I'm delivered from the power of sin, and I'm no longer condemned because of my sin, because Jesus paid the price to redeem it. But there is coming a day where I will fully experience what that redemption means. And God holds me by his spirit until that day. Well, we've seen some great promises from the Word of God about the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And as we've done each week, for just a moment, I would like to talk about some responses to this doctrine of the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. What should be my response to the fact that the Holy Spirit seals me and holds me until the day of redemption? Well, number one, I should have gratitude for my sealing. Now, there are some people who look at a doctrine like the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is a part of a bigger doctrine called eternal security. The idea that when we trust Christ, God holds us in relationship with him. That when he gives us eternal life, eternal life means eternal life. From the moment that I believe going forward, I have spiritual life. If I only had it temporarily, that would not be eternal life. That would be temporary eternal life. And that's an oxymoron. Eternal life means from that moment of faith, I have a new spiritual life, and it continues. So, some might look at that and say, well, now, wait a minute. If that's true, what's to keep a Christian from saying, hey, I'm going to heaven, let the good times roll, I can do whatever I want. What keeps them from doing that? May I make an observation? I find gratitude to be a greater motivator than threat. Because of what Jesus did and my gratitude to him for my salvation, that's what moves me to live for him. 
That's what encourages me to keep on keeping on because gratitude moves me to that. Now, when gratitude isn't working in my life because of a loss of perspective, the Word of God also tells me that God will do what it takes to remind me that I ought to be grateful. The book of Hebrews talks about believers who are being disciplined by God because they had lost perspective. Hebrews chapter 12 speaks of God disciplining those who become disobedient. And it says this, Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there that his father does not discipline? And if you are left without discipline in which you have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Now what's this verse saying? If I am a child of God, if I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ and I'm starting to wander from the truth, God will get my attention by chastising me, disciplining me to help me regain perspective. You know, when I go in a store and there's a kid misbehaving, I don't go over to the kid and say, all right, time out. Go over and sit in the corner. Why? Because that's not my kid. Now, if one of my kids or grandkids starts misbehaving in a store because we have a relationship, I will discipline them. Tell them that's not okay and put them in a place to where they'll rethink their position. God does the same with us. If we are genuinely a child of God, we're going to experience the discipline of God if we forget our gratitude. You know, I've heard some Christians say, man... I never get away with anything. Every time I step off the path, boom. I see other people get away with stuff, but I never do. You know what I tell them? Thank God you're a child of God. He disciplines you because he loves you, and you are his child. This is what God does to give us perspective. God is at work in me every day, to transform me into a more grateful follower of Jesus. And we need to remember that. When we really grasp what God has done, we will have confidence as we face eternity, not wringing our hands, clutching our pearls, and wondering, have I done enough to come into a relationship with God? John writes this in his epistle. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is as so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and he who fears has not been perfected in love. You know what the scripture is saying? When I really understand the love of God, I don't look to the end of life and wonder, where am I standing with God? It's settled, established. I have right standing with God because of the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, because of the saving work of Jesus Christ. Second application. Grace rather than works keeps me saved. My salvation began by grace, and I would submit to you that my salvation continues by grace. And as we reviewed earlier, always think about what grace means. Grace means God giving us something that we have not deserved. Works are the result of salvation, never the cause of it. So we have to remember that. I love a passage of Scripture. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul writes to the Philippians and says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Did you catch what that said? Who is responsible for bringing my salvation to its completion? God. 
And he's not finished with me until the day of Christ Jesus. That's the hope of this promise. Final thought, final response. We have a glorious hope that is ours in heaven. Gratitude is a big motivator, but so is hope. Now, when the Bible speaks of hope, it's not talking about wishful thinking. Last time we did an outdoor service, it was rainy and cloudy. And I could have walked in and said, gee, I hope it doesn't rain. But that would have been wishful thinking. The radar said it was going to keep raining. The rain said it was going to keep raining. So I had to come to terms with that. Hope in the scripture is a confident expectation in God. It is looking at what God has promised and fixing our eyes on that and saying, I will cling to that during the difficult times that I face. Hope sees us through suffering, persecution, sorrowful times, the loss of loved ones who have died in the faith, temporary setbacks, and so many more struggles. God's hope is secured for us because of the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote a little bit later in Ephesians chapter 1 the following, I pray that having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now that's a lot of words to say something very important. My inheritance, my hope, rests in the power of Jesus Christ. God directs that power toward me to transform me and keep me and hold me until the day of Christ Jesus when he returns and I appear before him. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that God directs toward us to change us into the people of God. This morning we've seen the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have seen the power that God directs toward us to not only save us, but to keep us saved. As you go through life and you face struggles and doubts, Remember these passages and the promise of the Holy Spirit, his ministry of sealing. He holds you fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through my fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold saves our his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his own side, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. But by him at such a
Go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen and good morning.